Hello and welcome to She Conquers Capital Season 3 Latina Edition. I'm your host, Stephanie Diaz, and you're in the right place for powerful conversations with the Latinas impacting the flow of capital. Season three, doubling down on interviewing Latinas exclusively on the show has been one of the biggest gifts I have given myself. And this week's episode is a big testament to why I'm, why I say that the energy that I experience being in these in these interviews with Latinas is like nothing I've ever experienced. And Natalia Bishop of Renew VC, she and I, when she and I get together, it is just like electric. And so I'm excited that she and I got to connect for an interview so that you all get to see the energy that Latinas bring to the table. Um, but also you get to meet your new favorite Latina VC, that is for sure. So before before we dive in to the interview, I do want to let you know about a lot of the resources that I have for you. If you are raising capital, whether that's from Angel, VCs, or from LPs as a fund manager yourself, right now I'm coaching women who are raising anywhere between 750K all the way up through 20 million. And while I'm closed for new coaching clients at the moment, you can check out a lot of my online resources. Um, and I have a free one for you you too. It's a 45 minute video training called how to pitch like a thought leader. I take my years of experience as a podcaster and public speaker and overlay that over the investor pitch and everything that I've learned having raised capital and screened capital and deployed capital. And so that all comes together. Um, and we actually follow a case study of one of my clients to help you pull it all together. So some real life examples for you to take and put into practice and a lot of the things that I share, you can implement same day if you're out there raising capital for yourself. So visit thestephaniediaz.com to uh, get registered. Like I said, it's a free training, how to pitch like a thought leader. And I can't wait for you to come back to me and let me know how it has changed you your pitching game. Um, so excited for you to check that out. But now I'm excited to share with you this interview. Natalia Bishop of Renew VC and also is the Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Louisville. Um, Natalia, and she's a founder, she's a community builder, like she's an incredible. And I feel like she is definitely going to be one of your new favorite Latina VCs. We talk a lot in this episode about the state of funding, what it means to raise capital as an underrepresented founder, what it can do to your soul as you are raising capital as an underrepresented founder, and how the team at Renew is doing things differently. So here she is, Natalia Bishop. I love it. Well, Natalia, I'm so excited that you're here and that we get to dive into this conversation. You and I always have like that energy when we connect. So I'm thrilled to just dive in. I'm so thankful that you asked me to be here. So I'm super excited. <laughs> well, you are amazing. Um, and there may be some people watching and listening who don't know who you are and what you're working on. So give us just like the, the quick background. The quick 10 second background is I wear a lot of different hats uh, and I kind of multifaceted, but um, my full time job, my my full time gig is actually the director of innovation and entrepreneurship for the University of Louisville here in Kentucky. Uh, I also as a full time side gig, <laughs> do a bunch of other different things, uh, including uh, being the uh, entrepreneur in residence for Amplify, which is our public private partnership here in the state of Kentucky to far their innovation. Uh, and more recently, I joined Renew VC as a general partner. So I'm really excited about that work, uh, as well as uh, being on the board of a bunch of uh, really cool accelerators, specifically targeting Black and Latinx femme identifying women. And um, yeah, a lot of, of uh, work in the community. Uh, I'm like screaming on the inside. We need more women <laughs> 
at the VC partner level, cutting checks, we need more Latinas at the VC partner level, cutting checks. And that is exactly what you are doing. And we're going to dive into all of that. But I want people to know what got you here too, because you are a founder in your own right. You have built communities. Tell us a little bit about that too. Yeah. So I uh, jokingly say that like, even though entrepreneurship sort of happened to me, like it was like, I was not trying to do this y'all because I, as an immigrant and you know, that it's like, you're like a lawyer <laughs> or you're a doctor because your parents are like, mm. and so, um, you know, I was very much in like the corporate lane, but entrepreneurship sort of, sort of happened to me. Um, but I come from a long line of like matriarchs that were side hustlers. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, you know, I think it was in my DNA. I was resisting it for a minute and then, you know, I fell into it. So I started as a creative entrepreneur. Um, I had a photography business prior to even thinking about scaling any technologies or anything like that. Um, grew it to six figures, had a couple of people in it and that morphed into a collective of photographers in a co-working space for creative that morphed into an innovation uh, and uh, entrepreneurial hub here in the city uh, called Story. Um, and then from there, the exposure to what I didn't know, like you don't know what you don't know, right? So mm -hmm. I know lifestyle businesses and I, I understand how, you know, franchising works. And so that's the, the scope that I had at that point in my life with, with the experiences that I had. And um, starting this, this innovation hub gave me this in into um, this, this technology, scalable, uh, replicable uh, sort of model that I never really thought I could be a part of, right? As a, as a Latinx, as a, as a female, um, you know, as a non-technical founder. And so when that happened, I, um, I started having lots of conversations with lots of different founders, like what's going on in your world? Like, what, is, what are your pain points? How can I help? And I uh, started gathering tons of data around it, decided to launch my own software company called Level Up. Uh, and that, this is back in like 2016. And, um, you know, scaled it, uh, did all the, you know, the check marks of what I like to call the, the little like badges that you have to go get, you know, yeah. especially regionally and here in the Midwest is like, you have to, sort of do certain things. You got to get into this accelerator and you got to do this one thing. And so uh, we were doing great. Uh, we actually ended up winning SoGal's uh, competition uh, out in San Francisco right before the world melted mm -hmm. and uh, all kinds of really so good stuff, but we could not race. I mean, we were having such a difficult time um, really getting getting to to the yeses uh, regionally. And even though I had the social capital and the network yeah. and all the things that they tell you you have to have. And so as I started doing, uh, you know, I talked, I think maybe 118 uh, investors, um, we had our, our, uh, our, this was our pre-seed. So we weren't going for a lot of money, uh, but it was a million dollars, which for me, wasn't a lot of money at the time. Uh, and, and um, we, we just sort of started looking at this as like, what are, what are the things that we are doing wrong? And some of the stuff, you know, you, you pivot and, and do better. And then some of the stuff was like, okay, this is systematic. Like. Uh, I started diving into what does it look like on the VC side? What, what are the no's coming from? What are the reasonings? And the reality is that, you know, um, I looked at it and 59 at that point, 59 uh, Latinx uh, females had raised over a million dollars. And this is back in mm -hmm. 2020, uh, late 2020. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, 59 is not a big number at all. And um I could be 60. I now know that I have all the information and I know I have all the work ethic and will to make that happen. But what am I leaving behind? And I have a family and I have, you know, another business I've been bootstrapping and, and you know, I'm going to leave my soul in the line. Mm. And, and, and do I want to do that? Is this the, you know, and, and part of this is like the founders thing. Like, it's like the thing that we've glorified of like, oh yeah, you know, you have to sacrifice so much. And this is true. You have to, it's it, every founder. I don't care what color you are, what gender you are, anything. Uh, but there's another layer when you're a Latina, right? There's yeah. like this other layer of like, and, and when you're a black woman and when you're a, a black man, like there's just this other layer of sacrificial trash <laughs> that you have to kind of dive into and so I was like mm -hmm. you know what yes I'm it. going to do this mm -hmm. yeah I'm going to pivot I'm, I'm going to well, I'm going to continue to do what I want to do I, I love and enjoy the mission of this company so we bootstrap it and we're going in a different direction I'm not going to stop but I'm not going to conform 
And what I am going to do is make sure that this doesn't happen to someone else. Like I want someone else to be 60 uh, or 61 or 65 or whoever, whatever the number is right now. Um, so how do I go about that? So I joined uh, Stanford's BC Unlocked, which is a great program. If you're trying to become an emerging manager or a general partner, um, it helps to kind of suss out your thesis. So shout out to the Stanford and 500 Global team uh, for helping me clarify that. Uh, I had the opportunity to go through that last fall. And, um, and then, you know, what do you know, like six months later, here I am and, and I just, you know, uh, joined Renew as, as a GP, so. Ah, oh, what an incredible story. And thank you for being so real about the capital raise um, and the, the inner journey that it is to raise capital as someone who doesn't look like people who traditionally raise million plus rounds of capital. Yeah. And um, it's so, I, I, that's what I talk a lot here on the podcast is not feeling like you have to leave your soul behind, um, you know, and, and get so far from who you truly are um, mm -hmm. in order to close that capital. But, you know, one of the real answers to all of this is if we could raise capital from people who look like us, who understand us where it's not so hard and it's not so biased, then we can, we can start to see real progress. And, yeah. and that's one of the biggest things. I think that it's still difficult. We think that, you know, there's been a lot of change in, in the trends and the, and the timing of this is, is great because um, we're sort of as a society in some ways starting to wake up to that and seeing, okay, th this has got to change. But then there's other conversations you have, uh, you know, when you're in regions like mine where I'm nine times out of 10, the, the FOD, right? The, the, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and you are hanging out with other VCs and they'll say, well, good ideas get funded. And they'll, they'll say it to you and you're like, mm, well, no, not really. This is not a thing mm -hmm. that happens because we all know that we, we, we can't say all, I, all good ideas get funded or good ideas get funded. And then on the same breath say, you know, at this early stage, we're not funding ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen. We're betting on teams. That's a very different, uh, that's a very different approach yeah, to funding. True. And, and we can't say not, not both of us can be uh, true at the same time. So which is it? <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, so. Well, I'd love, so the last time you and I connected, you were actually just getting ready to go into the VC Unlocked program. And so, you know, talking about how investors choose to invest and having done so much, uh, you know, giving so much of a uh, thoughtful towards your own thesis creation and things. What are some of the things that are really important for you as you start to deploy capital? Yeah, so uh, that's a really great question because um, money is flowing right now and it's flowing into a lot of places, but it's not flowing where it needs to flow the most, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. I think the underrepresented or historically underrepresented marginalized uh, founders. And I think for me, the most important thing is that the companies that we fund are translating into solutions uh, that are real for real groups of people uh, that have pain points that have not been addressed at scale, right? Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all gonna have to be a social impact component to it because you know there are things that are, that are being addressed that don't necessarily uh, have that triple bottom line, but, but if it has a component of an underrepresented founder at the helm, it typically addresses a community issue, right? It is typically an, a unique insight into something that has been oftentimes overlooked. Mm -hmm. And that's going to, by default, give you better returns, right? Um, by default, you you have an edge. Like that edge that everyone's looking for in VC because there's just so much money and so much capital growing out. Um, I think that's, that's the part we're missing, right? It's like someone else has a unique insight because of their lived experience. And we got to listen because there's, the population represents that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's no longer one single consumer uh, archetype. So uh, for me, it's really important. Uh, and for, for a new, uh, our thesis is specifically this, like social impact component or underrepresented founder, whether it be, you know, femme identifying or LGBTQ or black or brown. So that's what we're, we're going to put our money into. I love it. Why don't we dive a little bit more into Renew VC because there's a lot that is new and different about how you all are structuring this fund. So why don't you share a little bit more about that? 
Yes. So I, I you know, I toyed a lot with the idea of um, do I do I just launch my own fund? Uh, I mean, through the community work that I've done uh, here locally, I have I have had the opportunity to either create my own fund that was specifically for you know black and brown femme identifying or um, you know some stuff with the state. So I was kind of toying with the idea of like where do I want to put my energy into? Uh, and I uh, sort of serendipitously through my work. Um, got connected to uh, Mark Hubbard, who uh, was sort of like the the initial brainchild of, of this thing, and and uh, he's been working on this in this concept for like ten years, right? Um, and as we were talking, I was just supposed to introduce him to someone. You know how that goes. Mm -hmm. Introduce me to someone that you think would be great for this. And um, and the more I looked at the team that was being assembled, the more I was like, okay, if you want to go alone. It, you know yeah or mm -hmm. if you want to go far if you want to go together. fast go alone there if you, you want to go. <laughs> go far go together yeah mm -hmm. there you go um that just kind of kept playing in my mind um and you know it, it, the team that that we put together um is it's like 70 percent female first of all which i love <laughs> like mm -hmm. um but it's also um, these amazing rock stars, people that are have been community building operators, founders, people that have been deploying capital for a while in different ways. Um, you know, we have people that are PhDs and, and people that are in art. And so there's all this gamut, black, brown, you know, from India, from all different places. Uh, we're all over the United States. We're in Canada. And the idea of having a uh, almost like a group of like-minded individuals that are experts in their own specific rights and lanes um, that have been working with startup for as long as all of us collectively have and that when we first talked about you know bringing on some of us who were emerging uh, and new to the like actual deployment of dollars right um the conversation was very different than some of the conversations that i've had where it was like okay we'll bring you in as an associate or we'll bring you in as a you know a a, a, a principal or something like mm -hmm. that when um where they want you to cut your teeth and that's all right and fine but we're not gonna get there fast enough if we don't make some radical risky choices and allow people to prove themselves so yes um, yeah so i think 100%. that's kind of what happened yeah, that's kind of what happened here at Renew where Mark and Paul got together and they were like, hey, listen, like, let's do this. Let's not do it in a, nothing chaps me more than like when people tokenize you or you're just like, well, you know, you're going to be in a, in a panel or a board or whatever. And you're like the brown lady, you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? Oh, absolutely. And then, but you're bringing like 200% of what everyone else is bringing. Yeah, yeah I, I can't, I can't. Mm -mm, I can't deal with that. So, and you, and you know, like, I think as Latinas, we can like smell that from like a mile away. You're like, okay. And some, sometimes you're just like, okay, I'll do it for so, the Well, I think that there is a phase of your career where that's kind of the only option that you have. And so you, you know, and that's that first inroad, but then you reach a point in your career where you're like, no, my time is more valuable mm -hmm. than this. And that's mm -hmm. really a turning point. Um, but the opportunities that are still being provided to you when you realize I am more valuable than this, but what, what are my options now that meet my value now that I've yep. earned my stripes? That's right. the really disappointing part. A hundred percent. It's like you, you don't, you don't shake that initial layer uh, until much later than a lot of other people. And so for me to have someone come in, um, a, a team come in and say, Hey, like, no, we're like, we're not doing this. And, it, and it's clear that we're not doing this because of how we're approaching, you know, things like the carry, right? Things like the, how we are splitting our, our decision-making, uh, how we're building it, right? Uh, it's not like one person and then we're all just kind of like cheerleading and doing stuff on the side publicly. It is like, we are all in this. We're all bringing pieces of our knowledge to the decision-making, to the deal flow process, to the vetting, to everything. And I think the one thing that I really love about more than anything else is that empathy is like our, our North Star here. And so uh, empathy in the entire process from the LP side to, you know, how fast we can get back to founders, how transparent we are with the process, and, you know, and just uh, what happens when you get told no, because that part also really sucks, right? Uh, yeah. And yes. Yeah. It's part of so, the founder experience. 
I feel like it's really important. I love all this, by the way, as you know, <laughs> I mean, I feel like you and I have had co- real conversations about, about the, the journey. Um, but you really see like, there are so many opportunities for an organization, especially a VC fund to showcase its values. And you either see it from end to end, or you start to realize, well, we're saying this over here, but then what's happening on this side? You know, you really start to see the discrepancies. And especially in this category of VC, whether it's emerging, investing in underrepresented, social impact, when it's so value-driven in terms of the value prop outwardly, um, it's even more important that Mm -hmm. from end to end, an organization truly live out its values. And that's also going to introduce there are so many creative ways for, for organizations to double down and showcase. And that's what I feel like is happening right here. Like, let's do it differently. Um, and so I'm so excited. And I'm glad that you're one of those that are partaking. Um, you Thank just you. represent Latinas so well. And so, and this is just the beginning. So I'm excited to see where you take it from here. Thank you. I mean, it's a brand new journey. Uh, so I'm excited to kind of get going. And we have a big fund ahead of us. I mean, we still, we're early. We we literally just hit play on our website yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just like, uh, it's still very, very much very new. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's very needed because of already the amount of deal flow we're getting. And, and we've done things like, you know, taking out the, the warm intro, and this is not new, like, these are things that other firms are doing. And so how do we take those best practices and bring them in and put them together in a way that's transparent and kind and, uh, and full of empathy, right? So mm-hmm. um, I'm just excited to, to see what we can do, how, how much good we can do here. I love it. So let's let's kind of deviate a little bit. Um, you know, something that's really important for me with this series being Latina, the Latina edition of She Conquers Capital is giving the space for us to talk more about our culture and our upbringing, because we don't usually get to bring that into the, yes. the work that we do. So share a little bit about your, your background and your culture yeah. and how it influences how you show up in the world absolutely absolutely so i'm from colombia originally i'm from barranquilla so i like to joke mm-hmm. with you. like it's like, like shakira. Shakira, <laughs> me shakira and like gloria from from other family that's it but <laughs> barranquilla so i came to the united states uh straight to kentucky straight to louisville i was uh 17 years old fresh out of high school i graduated the year before um and louisville has a really unique situation happening with the university having a partnership with UBS. So you had this opportunity to go and get your college degree if you work the graveyard shift. So as a 17 year old, uh, you know, the whole normal story of like, you bring your whole family with $400 in a suitcase, <laughs> that was us. And so it was me, my brother, my sister, my grandma, and, uh, and my little, yeah, my, my little sister, my mom. And so um, it, 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 it was a immediate culture shock because um, you know, my, my country is vibrant and full of, if you watch Encanto, that's literally my life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like multi-generational and mm-hmm. excited and, you know, and full of flavor. And then, you know, we get here and the beautiful thing about Kentucky is still South enough to be kind and people hold the door and are sweet, uh, but then also North enough to not be like backwards. Uh, so it's a good happy medium um so coming here as a teenager I I think I still wasn't fully cooked uh so I had a lot of my roots of my um understanding of values and and how I moved through life and joy uh from being being uh born in Colombia and seeing what what real scarcity is right like what real um trying and being talented and in in doing all the things and still not being able to to put food on the table. I've seen that, I lived that, Um, versus being here and seeing, you know, the American dream, like, right? You work hard, you get what you, you get what you want and and things happen. And so I um, I think that the work ethic came from, you know, my background, my my culture, Uh, my mom was always like, about gratefulness like we're grateful we have this shitty job but we have a job (laughs) yeah (laughs) right um and 
and uh, you do what you have to do, um, making sure that you're you're aligned with with your core, with what makes you feel uh, good about yourself, with your family, with your values, uh, and not compromising that piece. So that my culture is giving me my north star. It's giving me my I think my op- my my hopeless optimism, my risk tolerance. Mm-hmm. Um, I also had read somewhere that. Uh, immigrant founders perform like 30% better than normal people. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I said normal people as in like we're not all immigrants, but um, you know, than people who are not immigrants because you know, you're literally your brain is different because uh, yes. you have to, you know, switch languages and lanes and all the different things. So, um, so I think if it wasn't for that experience, I a, obviously I would not be here. And uh, but B, like I don't think that I would have chosen this path. Um, you know, if it wasn't for, um, for, for the, the reminder, the constant reminder that it's not just for me, right? It's Mm. for, it's for everyone else that looks like me and it's for the good of the world. It's for others just as much. It's for the survey space of it. So. Absolutely. And I love what you said about risk tolerance too. I definitely feel like there's, there's a hunger, but there's also like, when you've kind of left everything behind, you, you know, it, it doesn't seem as scary to like put it all on the line, you know, for something, for something bigger. So I love that. Uh, we're going to have a little fun and, and probe a little bit more into, into your culture. And we're going to do a little <laughs> rapid fire. So I'm going to shoot off a couple questions and you just say what comes to mind first. Okay. <laughs> okay. So favorite Colombian dish. I, uh, arepas. um okay so we go out dancing are you dancing salsa bachata or merengue Uh, wait say it again Ah, um what uh most i guess like most impactful family member not your parents my brother my brother, mm. no, this is hard, my brother and my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has this like, wait, I said one, now I have to say the other. No, no, it's just that. And I'll I'll go in a tangent if you give me, I know it's rapid fire, yeah, but if go you for give it. me a second, I'll, I'll tell you about this. So my brother and I only like 18 months apart. So, uh, and my mom was like a single mom. So like we parented in a way each other. Yeah. So he mm-hmm. was a very influential person to me. But then as I, and my sister and I six years apart. So I was kind of like, her motherly figure but as grown-ups uh we grew really 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 close and one of the things that happened um really like again this is super tangential but uh my brother-in-law um long story super short he died when he was 41 a couple of years back Mm -hmm. um three years back Uh, she, she was uh two weeks away from delivering their first baby and I, yeah, so it was a very tragic, like heart attack, you know, and I ended up having to be there um, for making like that life decision for him at the end of the day. Um, just in, in that, that whole experience just really changed who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say if it wasn't for her, like I wouldn't be that and my brother, I would be me either. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Different periods of, of life for sure. Um, last one, favorite Latin music artist? Maluma, uh, to represent. <laughs> and Carlos Vives. Carlos Vives and of course, yes. Okay, I love it. I just saw the new um, J-Lo movie with uh, Maluma. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's beautiful to look at too, yes. <laughs> offline conversation. Um, I love it. Natalia, thank you so much for being here. Um, Thank you so much for being a Latina in this space for us to follow, admire for the doors that you're going to open for so many founders um, that you're already opening for so many founders and VCs coming behind you. Like I'm just so thrilled to, to know you and, and to definitely stay in touch along your journey. So thank you for being here on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. And I, if you're a Latina or, uh, you know, looking for making a relationship with VC or investment, please, please hit me up on Twitter or, uh, or email me and let's hang out. All right. And I'll share all of her contact information wherever you're watching this. Thank you so much for joining in.